I'm unmuted, and I'm there. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, good morning, good morning. Um, uh, as, as Sandy C. Williams said, you know, rise and shine. Well, I will rise, but I might not necessarily shine. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, the subject is warming up um, in the 21st century, which actually um, is only different in a few details from warming up in the 22nd century. Um, so, um, and the 19th and 18th and every other. So um, now the first thing I'd like to talk about is the philosophy behind starting your musical day. Um, and, and, and certainly the part of your musical day that involves playing the flute. Um, I mean, I think for a lot of us, our musical day begins uh, within instance of opening our eyes with music happening in our heads. So um, from the very first instant that you are got your flute together, and you're ready to blow um, from that very first instant. Um, you want to be connected musically. Now, most people start their day with a chromatic scale. And what has that achieved? Um, well, it's a placebo activity um, because it's happening on automatic pilot. The ears are not involved. I mean, you could tell from how horrible that sounded. Uh, and, um, and plus, more importantly, you are practicing not connecting yourself. And practice is an enormously powerful force. Um, it always works. So whatever you're doing, you're going to improve that. And so you want to make sure that what you're doing is something you want to improve at um, and not something you want to get worse at. So like being disconnected is something that I, my personal goal is to be like the worst in history. You know? <laughs> um, um, and um, so now, so number one, try to remember, please, never play a chromatic scale to start your day. Never play a chromatic scale when you pick up the flute and begin to go, to blow. Um, so instead, let's say that, you know, you want to go from uh, to, well, how many ways are there to do that? Uh, there's zillions of them. And if you try to pilot yourself by ear, to hear it before you play it. Now, this is something that was not dealt with, certainly in my classical flute training, the idea of hearing before playing. Um, and um, in all honesty, my, my, my initial training as a classical flutist uh, didn't hold me back more than 15 years in my development as a musician um, because the ear was only remotely part of the picture instead of at the center. So um, now I don't have perfect pitch. So if I want to know where that is, I'll do what millions have done and play it. So now I know. So now from going from, I'm trying to imagine. Okay, I've got a plan. And so inside, I am singing. In my head, I am singing. So now, um, Let's begin at the beginning there. The, the first thing I you know, wanted to say is, you know, the idea of warming up on autopilot is not only incredibly inefficient 
And um, it, it also teaches you to not be musically involved. And for so many people, warm-ups are, you know, Toffinell and Gobert or Mokwar or whoever, you know, you choose to play. Um, and in the background of an extended daydream, you know, Oh man, what did I get? Oh no, I should take that out of the freezer, shouldn't I? And you know, and, and on and on. And um, well, what are you actually practicing? You're practicing not involving yourself. And you're getting better at it. So then you go out on stage to play and you can't find your concentration. Well, no wonder you can't find it. You've practiced not having it. So, you know, warm-ups are extremely important on many different levels. Um, and, and how you approach the very start of your practice is um, profoundly influential on what's going to happen through the whole practice session and through your experience as a performer of whatever kind of music it, it is that, that, that you're involved in playing. Um, it is fair to say that music is music. And um, so now, um, how shall I put this? Instead of thinking kind of, you know, I'm going to think in black and white. Okay, C natural. And then, you know, information goes from the brain and the fingering is done and we know the embouchure and all and, a, and we play it. Uh, and only at the end of that process is there sound and do we hear it and make any decisions about whether, you know, we think it's okay or not. Um, so instead, what we need to work towards and... You know, I mean, this took me years, uh, and, and, you know, the brain is not a computer. There is no preferences panel. You can't just flip things over to, you know, change the... So we've got to... For me, it involved a tremendous amount of work over an extended period of time. So once I, I've given myself the starting point, um, I hear myself sing it. Ooh, or ooh, whatever octave is free and comfortable for you. Um, if you're someone who's going to say, but I can't sing, we're going to deal with that because of course you can. Um, it's that you don't, and uh, rather than you can't. Uh, and um, I mean, unless you've had some horrific throat injury or something. And um, so... You know, for people who feel that they can't match pitches, which was me, absolutely. Um, you know, I would hear a note and take my best guess at what it was, but rarely got it right. Because, again, my whole process was detached from singing, which is what internalizes, you know, music. So, um, so if you hear, I don't know, a G and you try to sing the G, and you miss. Um, this was, I, I would try to do like, and I'd get, or something, you know, way, way off. Um, and immediately, you know, the court of self-justice, of which you were the defendant, the judge, and the jury, not to mention the prosecutor, um, um, but rarely the defense lawyer, so, you know, has adjudicated and said, well, that means you can't hear anything. It's all fake. Well, the truth of the matter, and you guys know what I'm talking about, don't you? So now the truth of the matter is there was nothing wrong with your ears at all. I mean, why have you chosen to make music such an important part of your life? I mean, if you can't hear it. Um, so obviously you can hear. And, um, 
and there's some people who can play quite musically who still couldn't, you know, match a pitch when singing. So what is the problem? The problem is that your good ear has never been connected to this muscle mechanism in your throat. So if you work on the connection, it will start to work. So rule number one kind of is, no matter what happens, if you're trying to go and you're getting well, glide your voice until it's in tune. And the corrections over time will get smaller and smaller and subtler and subtler. Now, the idea that some people are born to sing and others are born not to sing is also a fallacy. Um, I witnessed this with my own children. Um, I have a son who's 15 and a daughter who's 13, and um, their mother is a fantastic musician, uh, an amazing, improvising, creative pianist. Uh, <clears throat> you know, they got tons of talent from their mom and hopefully some from me too. And um, when they were really little, we encouraged them to sing. And when they first started to sing, and I'm talking like, you know, between one and two, like way back there, it was all out of tune. But it didn't take very long before it started to focus and get into tune. Why? Because they were doing this practice process, just, you know, without thinking of it as a practice process. And so they were able to connect what they were hearing to what they were singing. It was just a natural process. And um, if you've never done that, it's never too late. It's really important to remember that. It is never too late. So, um, so now, where do I suggest you begin your flutistic day? Um, and that would be with something called throat tuning. And now, the simplified model of the flutist body that we were all taught is um, basically, you know, posture and breath, fingers, and head, you know, embouchure, articulation, um, perhaps even eyes to see the music. Um, and here, ears. But what connects the head to posture and breath? I mean, what prevents the head from floating away? Um, it is the throat. And classical, American classical flute uh, pedagogy tends to have a simple mantra, hold your throat open, everything will be fine. Um, it doesn't work well enough. Uh, people suffer from days where they can't make a tone. Um, um, there are notes that sound great and notes that don't. Um, now, in all fairness, the open throat was a huge improvement, um, a major evolutionary step from the super tight throat that preceded it. And if you listen to those recordings of the, er the earliest recordings of flute players, those old Frenchies, and they are sounding like they are wringing the necks of chickens with every note. It is just so tight. Um, now, if you feel that's beautiful, well, that's how to do it. And, you know, beauty is in the ears of the beholder. Um, and, um, but it creeps me out. So, <laughs> and um, now, you know, I find, in all honesty, very few things more annoying than the French flute sound. Uh, when it's when it's done in the usual manner, it's it's um, you know if it, I've always thought of the flute as a voice, and and um, and and wish to sing at my most free and most expressive. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm about to say will apply for somebody who's got a completely different idea of what tone is if they want that tone to be as good as it can be. So now, it, 
when we're blowing a note on a flute, the air molecules are on a one-way trip. You know, we blow them, we focus them, they head over the embouchure hole, they do that wonderful flipping in and out thing, where would we be without that? Um, and then, you know, so many scientific terms are, you know, they're sterile, but the scientific term for what happens next is one of my absolute favorites. This excites the air into the flute, into vibration. You know, I mean, that's exciting, you know? <laughs> I think it's a wonderful, a wonderful way to put it. Well, now, that's the air molecules. And of course, those excited vibrations leave the flute, go out into the air. And certainly, if your audience is the New York Flute Club, hopefully everybody loves it. Um, now, um, what's happening with the sound, though? That's a much more complex journey. Um, of course, lots of the sound is propagating out into the atmosphere. So, but there's also an, and, um, you know, in precise scientific terms, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to define this as well as a professional acoustician, but this is what my discussions with the great acoustician Arthur Bernard um, inform me, that as, as Bernard put it, your airstream is a two-way street and the traffic is moving in both directions at the same time all the time and there is sound energy that is linking the resonances in your body to the resonances in the flute now experience has shown that resonances are never passive you know if they're working together tremendous things happen if they work against each other energy is just you know used up in this combat that could have turned into into sound so um now when i first learned this i'd been playing about 20 years and and i realized like okay in many ways i've only come to understood half of the story you know because there are two things going on there's me playing the flute which i thought i had a grip on um and there's the flute playing me which was entirely new information and um you know i worked most of the way through uh, bernard's book uh, fundamentals of musical acoustics um i thought my brain was going to melt um I mean, he was a great scientist. All the information is there, but a terrible writer. And, um, you know, so I would slog through some paragraph, you know, six or seven times to finally go, oh, that's what he meant. Why didn't he just say it? So, um, and, um, and so thinking about, all right, this, this energy coming from the flute passing through me. Now, remember, sound is traveling at the speed of sound. It's got no problem swimming up your airstream. If you can blow harder than the speed of sound, you've got a career in, you know, demolition. So, um, and uh, now, so, how, I was thinking to myself, well, how can I make this sound, this energy coming from the flute, most welcome what is the best situation that it could enter and i thought well if i had my vocal cords set up as if i was going to sing the pitch now it's important to realize that you know let's say the pitch is a b flat if you are tuning your vocal cords to any B flat, you are in tune with them all. You do not have to be in unison, which is a very good thing because who could sing that? You know, the second ledger line C, you know, which is a high note, but not that high. That's the soprano's high C, not our high C. So, um, you know, there's nobody really 
who's got a vocal tessitura that matches the flute, um, and um, and it's not necessary to have one. So for me, generally, I'm working two octaves below the flute for the simple reason that I'm male with a fairly low voice. <laughs> Um, most female flutists will find starting one octave below the flute will be a, a, a useful place. So now, anyway, so I tried it out. Um, I was, just like now, my throat doesn't feel so terrific. I've been talking away, it's a little dry. But I played a thrilling F major scale as best I could. Then I sang along with it as I played, as best I could. Um, it's 40 years later now, I'm better at it than I was then. a depth in the sound that's greater than it was before and that's the resonance in the body now uh, many flutists experience this um, horrible thing of you know like suddenly it's a bad day and bad days have a terrible habit of cropping up at the worst possible moment you know, at the audition, at the concert, you know, just when you really need everything you've practiced, all of a sudden, you know, it sounds like a very large colony of spiders has moved into your flute. Uh, and, um, and you can't blow them out either. So, um, and what's happened when that, you know, tension often goes to the throat. And if you're tense in that way, well, goodbye resonance because, you know, your vocal cords will not be moving as you play. So our goal is to have to be silently singing everything as we play. Now, silent singing takes a lot less physical energy than actual singing, and you'd be amazed at the speed that you can go at. You can throw tune behind this. Uh, now, if I could actually sing it with a good quality voice at that speed, I, you know, could go be famous. Um, and, um, but the silent part, you can really boogie. But how do you start? Because I think that's the important thing for today. The f number one, um, each flutist needs to find the lowest note that she or he can sing and play while singing effortlessly. <clears throat> this is not the lowest note that you can emit. It's the lowest note you can emit without any sense of work. So um, a handy dandy place to start, of course, is C natural. And we are going to sing and play a chromatic scale. You know, they're not totally verboten. So no, but I'm going to sing two octaves below the flute again, because that's where I'm comfortable. Um, I can probably successfully demonstrate it one octave below the flute also. But here we go. And now. <clears throat> the sense of work has entered the picture. And it's not that hard to hear it or feel it. 
And when you try this out, um, you'll see. Um, there's that moment when it seems like, oh, I gotta push my vocal cords to that position. And that means for our purposes now, we're simply too low. So I'm gonna back up a bit. Now that sounds really, and feels really free and easy to me. Okay, now <clears throat> we're gonna head over to Toffinel and Gobert number one. And um, you'll find this, by the way, all written out in um, <clears throat> This handy book, Tone Development Through Extended Techniques. And to the surprise of nobody, it is by <laughs> me. So now, um, there are four repetitions of the first five notes in the major scale. Right, that happens four times. Now, most people think of this as just a finger exercise. And again, they're practicing the wrong thing. They're practicing an arcane sequence of fingertip sensations um, and not music. You know, the ear, the heart, most of the mind is not involved in that. So we're going to take a completely different approach. First of all, we're going to slow it down to the speed that you can sing hearing the note that you're going to play before you play it. Now, this is the major scale. It's a sound that we've all heard a zillion times in our life. You know it. You know, you don't have to wait for the flute to tell you what the next note is. You know the next note. So, repetition number one, play you know, as best you can at the moment. And um, I, I'm a believer in practicing the way I plan to, to um, perform. And since almost always I'm planning to use vibrato while I play, I'm going to use vibrato when I'm playing warm-ups as well. Repetition number two, sing. Now, you can make the fingerings as you go along. You know, that's one more way of tying everything together, but we're actually going to open our mouths and sing. Nobody's going to die. I've been told by professional singers, years ago at least, um, I've improved since then, said, you know, you're not good enough to sing in a church choir. And I thought, now that's a win-win. But <laughs> so anyway, um, so repetition one, play. Repetition two, sing. And I'm using the syllable ooh because the low register of the flute kind of sounds like ooh. Repetition number three, sing and play together. Now it's called singing and playing, not playing and singing, because we are singing, putting and listening to the voice first. And then we're going to put the flute in front of the voice. Um, all you have to do when you're singing is purse your lips a little bit and the flute miraculously will start to play. I'm going to sing an octave higher. Okay, now repetition number four, 
play, but really feel yourself singing and hear the sound of your voice in your head as you play. Now, it's going to be your voice. It would be so great to plug in Pavarotti or anyone whose voice that we really like. But when we hear another voice, we are in the audience. It is the sound of our own voices that makes our bodies change. So then you would continue along in the manner of Toffinelle. etc. until you felt the first signs of tiredness in your voice. And if you're not somebody who normally sings, that is going to happen very quickly. And it's okay. It's normal. You go like, hey, I'm normal. So, um, <laughs> so, um, and at least in that regard, I am. So now, um, so now once you felt that first sign of tiredness, it's time to stop. These are muscles you're not used to using in this particular way. Their strength will build as you use them daily. And it is the everydayness of this as in every other warm-up and as every other kind of practice that matters. Um, and, you know, this is not the sort of thing to try to do once a week. Uh, you'll get almost no benefit from it. It's the everydayness of, of practice that matters. You know, we don't all have the same amount of time every day, that's for sure, um, but <clears throat> something. It's hard to imagine the day where there isn't five minutes even. But that five minutes, particularly for an amateur, is such an important bridge from one day to another. Um, and, and then it's time to move on to whatever comes next. Now, um, let's flash ahead. It's now a couple of months later. And you're doing pretty okay with Toffinelle. And in fact, you're reaching the point where it's getting a little kind of high to sing. Well, at that point, you need to downshift your voice an octave um, to stay in the range that you can sing comfortably. But then we confront this problem, which is when we are singing and playing, we are always singing softly and gently. And <clears throat> singing, the reason we started in the low register is that the airspeed for singing softly and gently and for playing the flute are closest together. Now, what happens when we go upstairs? You know, by definition, singing softly and gently means the air is moving slowly. By definition, playing the flute higher and higher means the air is going faster and faster. Um, so how do we rectify that? It seems to be a dichotomy. Well, the answer is we're going to do both. Um, the air is going to pass through the vocal cords softly and gently. And it's going to proceed at that leisurely pace until it gets to the embouchure. And the lips are going to purse forward. And we're going to compress the air there and make it go faster. Okay.
Now, needless to say, that's going to take some practice. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm extending the lip tube. Um, and, you know, one of our most meaningful mantras as flutists is kiss the sound, don't bite it. So it is a kissing motion, not a biting motion. Uh, we will leave the biting to others. Um, and now this same kissing motion happens to be how you make a decrescendo. So you're actually practicing several things at the same time. And the intelligent practicer is not trying never to do only one thing at a time. Um, so many people use the methodology that they were taught as children. You know, I mean, when I was eight, I started to play the flute. It was one thing at a time. And I did each one diligently five times, sometimes six. And there were five things to do. It took half an hour. Everything was great. Well, how many things do you have to do now? You know, particularly, let's say, if you're, you know, a musical student or someone who's really serious about playing or a professional, if you did them one at a time, you would never emerge from the practice room. We'd have to hook you up with an IV bottle. And, um, and plus, one of the things that many college, you know, advanced high school students and college students grapple with, which is just when you're actually starting to get good, practicing gets more and more boring. And well, why is that? Well, your mental and emotional capabilities have grown immeasurably as you've grown up. But if you use the methodology that worked fine for an eight year old, it's not going to work for an 18 year old who is going to be bored stiff if she has to think of one thing at a time. So, um, you know, and one of the things that really keeps you involved is this singing inside your head. Um, you know, it's very hard to think about something else when you are singing the music in your mind. So now, the other thing, of course, that when I demonstrated singing and playing through the range of the flute is one's going to have to make one's lips stronger. And I sincerely believe that most flutists are not strong enough to play the flute well. Um, this idea of the relaxed embouchure, you know, it made sense over a century ago, when people were changing from wooden flutes to silver flutes. The embouchure used at the turn of the 20th century on those old, old Haynes wooden flutes or, um, you know, the Rittershausens and the Rudel carts, you know, the, on those flutes, the harder you squeezed, the clearer they got. That's an exact quote from Jeffrey Gilbert, by the way who lived through this change. And I own a Rittershausen flute made in around 1908. And it's true, I can use it as a Nautilus machine for my lips um, because there seems to be no upper limit. The harder I squeeze, the clearer it gets. It's amazing. Now, it's not a flexible sound, but you know it can make a very beautiful sound in a very small coloristic range that shoots out like a laser. Um, and um, well, you know, those French flute players started showing up with their Louis lots and people went, oh, colors, dynamics, you know, that's better. And so they made the change. 
And they discovered very quickly that if I used the same embouchure that would work on a Rittershausen on a, you know, an early silver flute, it sounded dreadful. And very quickly they learned that if they relaxed, it would sound a lot better. Well, what were they relaxing? Powerful, muscul muscular, strong embouchures. Well, relaxing worked so well for them, they told their students to relax. Their students told their students to relax. Everything got really relaxed. And so, you know, and now much of American flute playing is laughed at in other parts of the world. You know, with the cheeks puffed and, and all. I mean, it's okay for a mezzo forte legato sound, but you can't play loud. You can't really loud. You can't play really soft. Articulation is almost non-existent. Um, and so, you know, I played in a flute quartet with Nicolet. I've stood next to Galway. I've stood next to Baker. I mean, they've all got very strong chops. And there's a reason for it. You know, if you're going to control that kind of huge airstream to really make a sound that's going to fill a big house, you've got to have some command. It's absolutely necessary. And so the best way I know to strengthen the lips while you're also improving your sound is playing natural harmonics. And um, loads of other people have come to this conclusion too. And, and once again, um, there's a whole natural harmonic boot camp here in tone development through extended techniques. Uh, if you play through those exercises, you are really going to sound better and your chops are going to be in a new and much better place. Um, so now, uh, but we're going to start without trying to blow our brains out and without doing what we can't do. Um, the way to do what you can't do today is to do what you can do today. So, um, so for the purposes of this first exercise, I'm not going above the third octave G. And we can, once again, starting on C. Now, okay, pre-hearing. Wherever that works for you. Feel it in your, hear it in your ear. Feel it in your throat. Give your best shot at forming the right embouchure and go for it. Double, triple forte. Now here. Okay. Move the jaw forward, lips forward. Move the jaw forward again, lips forward. Now, if everything came out sounding in a way that would really delight you, great. Cross the bar line and head to be natural. But if you didn't feel like, you know, if you felt there was room for improvement, we can get to work. Now, it's an artifact of the flute sound that when you are looking for the spot, whoa, whoa, that spot, it's easier to hear with the sound of the harmonics. I don't know, can't tell you why, but it's, it's been my experience and that of countless other people. So this C can be played from a low C fingering. Now I'm going to fish around embouchure wise. And when I found what I thought was the spot with the harmonic and just changed the regular fingering, there it was at the heart of the sound. Now, um, I hope this is coming through Zoom okay. Um, now, um, now, one octave higher. Now, that C can be played from low C. It is 
and also from low F. It's the fourth partial of low C, and the third partial of low F. We call it a regular fingering, but it's actually the second partial of that C. So now, um, if we find the place where we can freely change between these fingerings, Without the sound jumping around, this is a good clue that we're, we've located it. Um, and located it, I mean, again, make sure the throat tuning is active and the inner ear is active. You know, the embouchure cannot make up for what didn't happen in the throat. Um, and the throat cannot make up for what didn't happen in the ear. So the ear always comes first. So now, now, if your jaw is in too far, as you change fingerings, the flute is going to bark at you. If your jaw is out too far, the flute will squeal at you. It'll do something like that. So the place where see, and that's how you locate. You know, it, I mean, we all know that there's a best jaw and embouchure position for every note at every dynamic, and this is how we're going to locate it for the dynamic we're using right now. If we're going softer, everything is going to move more forward. Jaw forward and up a little bit. And if we're getting louder, it's going to be jaw going down a tiny bit and back. Um, basically, the same action as low to high and high to low. So now that G. First of all, if we play it with a harmonic fingering, it is going to be flat ski. Um, and the regular fingerings were invented to correct that. Um, but for our purposes right now, we're not going to correct it. We're going for the resonance. Um, if you'll see in, in, in the tone development book, on page two, the coming attraction arrives and all those corrections get, are, are there. Uh, but for the first go, we're not. We're just going to go for pure resonance. Now, this G has got a multiple of possible fingerings. We can play it from low C, low E flat, low G, and the first finger C. And um, you may find at first that, you know, that's challenging for the strength of your lips, and that's good. We want to challenge Robert? ourselves. Yes. Robert, it's Deirdre. So I hate to do this. I would listen to you for another hour, but they're going to kick us off this platform shortly. So we have to stop. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then, um, I do hope that this has been useful. Um, I'm going to shamely plug my Robert Dick Contemporary Flute Week. Um, and you can find that on the web at Robert Dick Contemporary Flute Week, all one word, dot com. Uh, it's happening in North Carolina, the 27th to the 3rd. Uh, we're all going to be vaccinated and we're going to be fellow human beings. And believe me, the things are going to be very, very rigorous. Um, and if we're going to get kicked off this platform um, shortly, um, does anyone have any questions? Um, if you do, either unmute, like the fastest thing would be just to unmute your microphone and um, 
and ask, Okay. I have a question that's very quick. I want to say thanks, but first I, w I also want to give you the opportunity to let people know how to contact you if they do have questions to ask you. Okay, well, it's super easy. Send me an email at robert at robertdick.net. Okay, I, I'm not a text guy really. Um, you know, I've got one lame thumb that I use, um, but um, Email works great. Um, if, if you actually want to take some lesson, a lesson or some lessons on this and just work together, um, I do lessons on Skype. And, um, you know, send me an email, robert at robertdick.net, and we'll, 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 we'll connect it. So, um, well, look, thanks a million. It was a real pleasure. Um, you know, the New York Flute Club has got a big spot in my heart. Um, you know, the right ventricle. So, <laughs> and right. um, thank you so much. And thank you. Okay. Bye bye, everybody.